The human experience is underway. We are diving back into the paranormal with our guest tonight, Mr. Robert Bruce. His book is Practical Psychic Self-Defense. My co-host, Dr. G, is in the studio. Mr. Bruce, welcome back to HXP. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, good to be here, mate. There there were a couple editions. I mean, you 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 revi- did you revise it? You updated the edition of the book. How how did how recently did you do that? I um I completely rewrote the book um through well I originally did it in about two in the year two thousand I think it was uh, with the first edition and um, <coughs> it actually came about as a result of an argument I had with my publishers oh. and uh, one of the publishing editors um, um, who should be nameless. <laughs> uh, took issue with some of the thi- you know some, some things, things uh, in my first book, Astrodynamics, and we started, and we started talking about psychic self defence and that. And anyway, the, it ended up with like, like uh, uh, ten, ten page letters going, going backwards, backwards and forwards, forward. and uh, we ended up with about a dozen people, other authors, publishers, and professionals in the uh, the field, quite well known people sitting in and watching, you know, being CC'd these emails and that. And um, I um, won the argument, um, but right at the end of it, while I was, like, banging the table saying if I wrote a book like that, it would have this in it and this in it and I'd do it that way and bugger your ideas, you know, they're stupid. And uh, my publisher said, great, we agree with you. Here's a contract. (laughs) I wasn't intending to write it, but they gave me actually gave me a formal contract. So uh, yeah, your your writing style was a lot different. I really enjoyed the animation in in the words that you used, and I, I loved especially how you compared negative entities as a sort of malware and the universe as a sort of operating system. That was really cool. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty effective uh, analogy. Um, anyway, just to finish that story off quickly. The uh, I rewrote um, Practical Psychic Self Defense Handbook in about 2011, 2012. I get, did a major rewrite on it, uh, and because since I first uh, wrote that, my experience and understanding had grown enormously, and I'd come up with a lot of new countermeasures and understandings and, and protocols and that and that. And, and, so, and so a lot of feedback from people that had the book, ideas and that, how to make the book better. So I applied that, and this is where the second edition came from, and it's very slick. We love it. Yeah, you can tell that there there is a different energy to it. With the, I have both versions. I have the first edition and the second, and you can you can tell the difference in the... The, the passion level change. So uh, if we could just get right into it, uh, what do you what do you think the main cause of psychic attack is, Mr. Bruce? I don't know about, I suppose it's bad feelings or, or um, um, but in my experience, um, it's probably being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's like if you, I mean, if you were saying, what is the main cause of shark attacks worldwide? Right. And it generally comes down to, there's lots of reasons you can apply to, to it, but it comes down a lot to being in the wrong place at the wrong, wrong time. time. Uh, yeah. Having the right genetic makeup, the right psychological makeup. And because keep in mind, we're dealing with hereditary uh, spirits as well, coming down through family lines, uh, which were caused by like curses um, maybe hundreds or even thousands of years ago and still alive today as they were hundreds of years ago. Um, then, of course, you get malice uh, from people. You get jealousies. Um, for example, a wealthy businessman may have, have enemies. And the enemy go is uh, if the enemy is the type of person that has, has psychic, psychic abilities, abilities and broods, uh, a psychic attack can result, or he may go and hire a black witch or so magician witch. or witch doctor. Yeah, you would describe these as like almost thought projections or thought constructs that are stuck yeah. out in the astral realm, and they're just kind of attaching themselves to these other people, so to speak. Well, that, that that's, that's one scenario. scenario. <laughs> hmm. 
Interesting. So, so how do you distinguish a psychic attack versus just a negative kind of thought or thinking pattern? The symptoms are different. I mean, I, like an anxiety attack, for example, uh, can and often does have physical um, uh, conditions which are well known. For example, uh, some people have like a wheat intolerance uh, because, you know, all, all modern wheat today is genetically engineered, genetically modified. It was done in the 60s using primitive methods. Now, some people are very sensitive to that. And I work with a lot of people that have anxiety attack, depression problems and get them off weak wheat and all those problems stop. Now, the symptoms are very much like a psychic attack. You could even say, in some cases, like a demonic attack. But, um, yeah, the, I always look for physical causes first. But there's a big variety of different types of entities and different scenarios which can relate to, you know, a person or a family coming under psychic attack. It's not one size fits all. I mean, petty family jealousies and people that just don't like you, um, you know, come into contact with a sociopath, psychic, uh, psychopath that has uh, some psychic ability. That's a That's bad, a bad one. one. So, Rob, can you kind of like take us through the backdrop of there seems to be a hierarchical element. We described this last time when you were asked on here of, you know, you have these thought projections, you have these negative constructs that are occupying the space. But then on top of that, <clears throat> there seems to be another level where there are entities and there are levels of intelligence. Have you had experience in interacting with these kind of entities or what is, you know, what is the engagement they have with humanity? Yes, I've done that. People are more comfortable thinking that, um, um, you know, negative entities, I call them negs or negative entities, uh, which is classes everything from a common negative type thought form that's just annoying up to the higher demonic type attacks, which, of course, much nastier. But people are more comfortable with them, you know, calling them thought forms. Um, they don't like to think of them as being real. But then again, angels and spirit masters and things like that, they're, of course, real, real, real intelligent, intelligent beings. But, I mean, yeah, 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 what you're looking, you're looking here are two here. sides of a coin here, one side being negative and the other side being positive. And they complement each other. And it's like two sides of the magnet, positive and negative. And it is like a balance in the universe between these two um, great Forces, forces these, these, yeah, which we're working, we're working with here. here. But yeah, I've had uh, experience with the higher entities, and that includes angels as well as demons um, and spirit masters and things like that. So on both sides. Could you could you share for our listeners maybe one of your own personal experiences with one of the tougher demons or one of one of some of the tactics that you use to kind of get out one of the more stronger entities that that have affected you? Well, I, I come under attack here um, um, quite, um, quite frequently, given, given the work that I do. Every, every probably every once a month, I'll get some kind of, uh, you know, psychic demonic attack here. What, is that, what does that uh, mean exactly? I'm sorry to interrupt, but what is like, how do you sense it? Can you kind of take us through the process also? Yeah, well, it'll often, it can happen through Skype, it can happen through email, but often it comes from uh, giving distance healing and help or personal help, including uh, healing and exorcism. Um, now, when you're uh, healing somebody, you're trying to release them from something negative. Uh, when you do that, you will often make enemies. And, and the, de the demons and the evil spirits, call them what you like, they are quite jealous, vengeful type vindictive creatures. So if you mess with their territory, with what they are doing, they of course will immediately attack you. And that and typically, typically starts like out as, it's a bit like an anxiety attack. You feel this um, tingling in the energy body, rather unpleasant tingling and heaviness. heaviness. And you'll, you'll often, often feel, feel your mind becomes polluted. polluted. You will get all these horrible thoughts in your, in your mind. mind. Um, uh, angry, angry, violent, violent, cannibalistic, sexual, sexual, you name it. 
icky, nasty stuff that will try to get into your mind. And, of course, if you don't have good control of your mind, then, um, you know, that that is a big problem. So, uh, but you also can get uh, cramps and pains in the body. You can get them anywhere. Uh, you could double up with stomach cramps, get leg cramps, uh, sudden pain. Sudden pains that come and go with no apparent reason is a primary symptom. Like if you get a sudden pain in the shoulder or the back uh, for a minute or two and then it goes away and then it comes back. You know the analogy of like a witch sticking a needle into a wax doll? Yeah, like an effigy almost? Yeah, like the typical voodoo type thing, you know. That is actually a a really good uh, example of how it happens. If you have a uh, like a voodoo doll which is magically connected to a living human being and if you torture that doll, put it over the fire, stick pins in it, you will, you know, uh, cause... Uh, enormous problems for the uh, the person that represents. So that so that person that's doing that type of work, that negative work on an individual. Say they have like a how does how does that work? I mean, what is your understanding of it? Is it just like the concept of prana or the energy is being directed into that individual? What is is it just working on another realm that we can't completely understand? How does that actually that thought form get to become an attack on another individual? Well. There was, uh, they uh, in that situation there, any magical attack situation, they're using the magical law of analogy, where you get a doll and you might make it of wax, you will get a, uh, maybe a photograph of a person, you might get a hair sample or a bodily fluid sample, which you would incorporate into the doll. You would then baptize the doll in the exact, exact name of the person you want to attack. And um, various rituals to kind of personalize it. And then you would, um, uh, uh, p- by preparing the, the doll, and this is similar to any magical attack, you would project like a dark fluid into the, um, the doll or the whatever you're using. You could be using a photograph various methods for doing this and you would project like a, a, a dark fluid which has um, negative intentions attached to it and in that case I mean what it, it's exactly the same as giving healing to somebody energy healing but it has with the opposite intention I mean if you know how to heal somebody to give energy healing you know already how to how to attack somebody because the technique is exactly the same, only the intention is very different. You mentioned you mentioned in your book that uh, there, like stress and you know, the lack of sleep, can open your aura for and make you more susceptible to attack. Do you find do you find that sleep paralysis and the lack of sleep is a, also a, an indicator of a psychic attack? Yeah, definitely. I mean, sleep is hugely important with uh, if you're ever under psychic attack. I mean, you must get sleep because one of the um, most common number one um, goals of any negative entity that is attacking somebody and intending to attack them for a while is sleep deprivation. Now, if you can deprive a human being of sleep for a few days, their mind and their will go to complete mush and all of their natural defenses drop. So you can see why that would be a high priority for a negative, negative. entity. Why is so that? I advise why? people that I work with to, I mean, do anything you have to do. I mean, using my countermeasures, which involves, of course, you know, leaving the room, uh, for sleeping in the car, sleeping in another house, go to a hotel. These things don't travel well. And if you go from one room to another or even to another another house, or a hotel, you'll often get a break of at least a, a day uh, before it'll come back okay. again. Uh, so that gives you a break, but you must get sleep. Go to your doctor, get some good drugs, whatever it takes. <laughs> you must sleep. You know, absolutely. Otherwise, you will lose the battle. So you also mentioned in your book that, I mean, it, there's a lot of people talk about how cleanliness is next to godliness, and you say that negative entities kind of attached to garbage and uncleanliness. 
Why do you, is there a vibration that's, that's, that they're attaching to? I'm not really sure on the exact, I mean, you could call it a vibration, uh, but what you have is, um, let's say you compare a, you know, a normal person's room, which is, you know, clean and tidy with fresh sheets and that and smells nice. It's regularly cleaned and vacuumed. Compare that to like a, an older bachelor type. I'm sure we all know somebody like <laughs> that. You know, that hasn't changed his sheets in a year. And, you know, there's rubbish piled up. He hasn't vacuumed the carpet for a few years. And there's like, you know, food stuff, a bit of dog poop dried up in the corner and huge piles of dirty clothes and that. I, I know a man like this and I visited him a while back and he was having attacks and I clairvoyantly saw this thing. Um, and this this man was so bad. If you know, if you know Steptoe and Son, the old TV show in England, but it was like he would open the door to this, this, you know, the main bedroom in this house. You could only get the door open halfway because you hit a box. To get into the room, you had to take a very large step over a big pile of books and stuff. And then you have to sort of filter your way through piles of old clothes and things. And it was, it was really good. smelly. And then you get to the bed, which had, you know filthy sheets and stuff. Um, he did change his pillow slips occasionally. Um, <laughs> but the room was smelly, you know, smelled like a dog kennel almost. Now, I saw this entity. It was like a large snake. And this is the very common type of entity. They actually show up in photographs quite often. And you get a snake like a, it's like a, the size of, a, say, a 25-foot anaconda, quite a big snake. And you could see the snake the sort of diving of through the garbage and under the bed yeah. and uh, um, through the old clothes and that. They seem to be attracted to that sort of um, um, environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you talk about some of the core affirmations. I'd like to get into that a little bit. Um, I like them. They 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 they're good. Uh, I am loved and I am worthy, I am safe and free, I am powerfully protected, I am the master of my body and ruler of my mind. Why do you think these affirmations are so effective? Well, though, in a psychological sense, those are some very, very core needs for any human being. Uh, it's, it's like, like core, to be loved, loved and, and to be worthy, to be, to be powerful, powerful, protected, to be safe and to be free. Very, very core needs psychologically. But, and the more these are used by people, and I have thousands and thousands of people using them regularly, uh, they have gained, I mean, apart from the source, they were given to me by a master. And the, they have accumulated more and more, more power, power than they're they used. used. Yeah. So, so, they, yeah, yeah, so, they're, so they're growing they in power. power. But, uh, and that is something simple. It's, I tried to stay away from anything religious. I mean, pick a religion. I mean, they're not uh, trying religious paraphernalia and things like that. The religious approach to psychic attack, it's pretty much like the New Age approach to uh, psychic attack and that involves prayers and angels and visualizations and things like that. And to be quite frankly, it doesn't work. I mean, I've tried those things to death. Now, I'm sure there are priests and that of various religions that have a great deal of faith and that is ingrained in them that can actually have an effect that can actually do some good with their prayers and rituals but it is a person it is not the words and the books itself the average person picks up a bible and starts reading prayers and things like that um you know like get behind me satan things, things like, like that. that i mean the entities would just laugh at you they don't work there's quite a difference there if you get an experienced priest that is like experienced with entities and demons and things like that. Uh, it is the power of that person, the personal power, which makes the uh, prayers and the rituals work. And we're talking magical rituals here. The Catholic Church particularly uses quite a lot of magical rituals in their services. So, so have it's you quite a magical organization in that sense. Have you found any specific symbols that are effective against warding off entities? The pentagram is the probably the most effective, and uh, that is a pentagram that has to be drawn 
correctly. You must start in the bottom left hand corner and you must do it in a clockwise motion. Um, because when you start at the bottom left corner and do it clockwise, that is that banishes the earth element. It's very specific. If wow. you start from another corner, you will be banishing the air element. Uh, if you go in another another direction, you go anti-clockwise, you will be evoking or invoking the earth element. Now, the pentagram banishment works because uh, there is 99.99% uh, .99 of the problem entities in the world are earth element entities. Human beings are earth element beings. We walk on the ground. We are of the earth. And so the entities that trouble us are also earthbound. Now, my research and exploration into that gives new meaning to the earthbound, the, the meaning of earthbound, uh, in that there is a la layer of en energy, very thin, that covers the surface of the earth. Every surface, over, over the oceans, over the land, up trees, up walls of houses, on the roofs, and through the inside walls as well. Every surface is covered with this energy, and this energy is caused by lightning strikes. Now, at any one time, uh, in we have 7,000 lightning strikes per minute hits this planet. That's an average. So what you have here, when, when lightning hits the planet, uh, apart from melting a bit of sand or something, even if it hits the ocean, you know, creates a bit of steam. Um, the a massive amount of electricity floods out instantaneously over the entire surface of the Earth, just above the surface of the ocean, I mean, like a millimetre above it, and over the land instantaneously covering the entire planet. So you have a field of energy which has been around for like billions of years, which is like perpetually dissipating. This field is known about scientifically, and it is said that if lightning ceased to strike the Earth for 30 to 60 minutes, this field would dissipate uh, quite quickly. And it is in this field, which is like a separate dimension, which Earth-bound spirits, you could say Earth-type spirits, Earth-bound spirits, uh, are bound. They are locked into that like another dimension. And you're talking about these are two-dimensional beings. They are like a shadow on the ground that you cannot see. They are capable, most of them, of projecting a three-dimensional shape, like a hologram above them. And when you see an apparition or something like that, they have this shape, which is, you know, incidentally generated through your own body image. Say it's an ex-human being, ghost. Then a person has with them a built-in self-image and, you know, where your eyes are, your sight, your viewpoint and that. And that it's very much like in the astral dimension. The uh, If you have to project there, you look exactly as you perceive yourself to be. Hmm. And it's the same thing with uh, spirits, whether they're ghosts, uh, demons, negative spirits, whatever. And these are... Uh, my thoughts on this and the protocols I use are quite provable. You can demonstrate them, but of course you need some kind of an attack to be going on in order to actually prove this. Because if you have somebody under attack, let's say it's a baby, six months, nine months of age, and the baby is rigid and screaming, and maybe this has gone on for a couple of days, if you take the baby into the back garden, if you've got a lawn, and you put a garden hose down on the ground and turn the water on, so it's gushing water, and you walk through that water or over it, and you hold the baby so that the, the little baby's feet just brush the water as you cross it. The instant you cross that water, the baby goes limp, stops screaming instantly, and it's like the baby just woken up. It's goo goo gaga, and they usually fall asleep within 10 or 20 seconds because they are exhausted. Hmm. Very interesting. So, yeah, you go into this in your book and you you talk about how running water is a pretty effective barrier against these beings. So does this correlate back to the electromagnetic connection with the Earth and, and the grounding that we have with the Earth and that layer, that atmosphere layer that you were talking about? 
Yeah, definitely. It it goes back to that because um, if you force a net, this is what you're doing when you put running water gushing along the ground, or even when you jump in a shower. A bathtub doesn't work because the bathtub's insulated unless you have the tap running, and then it's then it's connected to the water pipe and to the you know the dam wherever the water comes from. It has a good earth there. Um, and also depends on the salt content as well. But you're creating a very strong earth. Now, in my experience, uh, if you can force a negative type entity, even a demon, into contact with a powerful electrical earth, then that demon is instantly demanifested and is sucked back into the planet. Now, the, the planet Earth we, Earth we live on is like, like a huge, huge electric, electric dynamo. It has, it has magnetic, magnetic fields field. like, like an electric engine, and, and, the, um, and the poles, you'll find the energy moves in, into the planet and out and of out the, planet. the planet. You get you this get, um, um, sort of effect like a donut, donut. Um, um, with energy, energy going, going in, in, and, you know, you've got the aurora borealis and that, which is evidence of that happening. So... Um, but in personal experience, when you do it, it's obviously going somewhere and all you've done maybe is you, let's say, if you want to capture an entity, you can capture an entity with a garden hose in various other ways. And just by putting a loop of garden hose or maybe a big coil of garden hose next to the tap and you stand on top of that and then you turn the tap on and the entity can't get away because... If you have the hose going around the outer circumference of the pile of hose first, uh, the water goes through there first and there's no way out. And therefore, you're standing on the big pile of hose, the hose. water's gushing That's through it, and it will pretty quickly demanifest the entity, uh, even if it's fairly, it's fairly uh, well entrenched in a person. Have you experienced this? Have you done this personally before? Or? Yeah, many, many times, yeah. Uh, for myself, I actually, actually, that method there for... Banishing. I actually develop that on the fly. Now, all of the methods I teach in there, I might get some ideas by doing research and talking to people and what they've done. And I always have to try it out in a field situation. And I had, a, I was using running water, and this was about while I was halfway through writing, I was actually doing the final editing of the original uh, Psychic Self Defense. Uh, and my son came down, my yeah, older son, son. then. And, and he um, was having this massive attack, and he arrived here, and that was the day I got a, um, um, a the face of a demon burned into my CRT monitor, um, yeah, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. But the uh, he came down, was having a really, really rough time, and so, uh, you know, I was immersed in different countermeasures, so I seized the opportunity dragged him outside and I did some pentagram banishment um, using the god names. I banish you in the name of you'd hair, vav hair, etc., etc. And I did that several times and then I grabbed the hose, hose. walked him over the hose. hose, I hosed his feet down and he was really in trouble. I mean, he could barely talk and barely stand. And, um, and you know, he was like stone cold sober but really, really troubled. And uh, then I had the idea... And I got, I, I coiled the garden hose up about 30 yards of hose there, and I grabbed him and <coughs> using, using my father like powers, I like forced him over the, um, to stand amongst the coils of, of the hose in bare feet. And then I put the hose running and washed his feet, his feet down, down. So it's really earthed. And then I did it's some more banishments for good measure. Uh, because these, I mean, these are life and death situations. You know, if you get it wrong, the person could die. I mean, they could die from the actual attack, or they or could they go could off go and off drive and head first into a truck, or kill, kill themselves. themselves. All kinds of bad things can happen. happen. So, so uh, uh, and after a couple of minutes, now this had been ongoing for about at the time probably thirty minutes, and this is why he came down to see me for help. Uh, and after about a few minutes, four or five minutes on the garden hose, he said, I'm feeling okay now, Dad. It, it's okay. It, it's, it's, gone. it's gone. And, and he'd had, he'd had, he'd had a, a, a number, number of attacks like that. that. And, of course, learning that, of course, when he had attacks after that, he would seek large quantities of running water, like a, a water main pipe 
uh, and water main pipes line every street in our society. Uh, it'll come down one side of the road or the other, and it's a matter of finding it. And if you're under attack, if you walk across one side from your house, say, and if, if nothing happens, you cross the road and walk to the other side, um, to the far side of other people's, you know, where people's other gardens start, you'll cross a water main and you'll know when you do because the problem will stop. So, Mr. Bruce, is, let of me... of course, there's water running through it because the running water itself seems to generate an energy as well as having a big earthing effect, there seems to be an energy involved with the actual running water. So let's just, if we could simplify this just for a little bit uh, for our listeners, if, if a person finds themselves in a position where they feel like they're being psychically attacked, what is, what is the thing that you recommend that they do first? Well, in the front of my book, The Practical Psychic Self-Defense Handbook, um, after a lot of feedback from users of that book there, I create, there's a quick start guide. It's the first thing you find. If you're under psychic attack, do this now. Number one, get in the shower. Now, just the act of jumping in your normal shower will stop 99% of demonic attacks, anything. It'll stop it cold. And this is why you'll find... Uh, many people, when they have like a psychotic break, um, a major anxiety, depression episode, the type where they would need to be hospitalized, uh, they are often found, when they call the ambulance, they're often found in the shower. And they may have been in the shower all night or even for a couple of days because it's pr they very quickly work it out. Even though they don't have the knowledge which is in my book, the understanding of it that explains it they know they get in the shower and suddenly they feel okay the mental pollution's gone their mind's working okay all the weirdness is gone these weird sensations you're getting and uh and then afterwards you step out of the shower and it starts to come back you know, and you pretty quickly work out that oh, i was okay, okay in the shower, in the shower so I'm back in the shower again and you find it stops again so in a situation like that i mean you're often talking about life-threatening attacks here you feel like you are literally losing your mind and you may be suffering a lot of pain you may have difficulty walking with spasms and cramps and tremors and um, so you get back in the shower and you feel fine and you can't work it out because no one's ever told you but once you understand this when you get under the shower you make a plan what you're going to do next because get under the shower the attack stops and they say what am i going to do okay well i'll try going uh, another another plan. plan. Turn Just all the plan. overhead lights on. Uh, light some incense. Lots and lots of incense. Uh, I mean, if you've got a packet of incense there, light all of them. You know, because normally you need a sensor where you're going to burn some granules to create a lot of smoke for incense. But if you've only got incense sticks, then, then light a dozen at a time. And, uh, and that will help. The overhead lights will help. Put some music on. Uh, you can get pots and pans, bang them together, causing percussion, uh, which helps to break up the astral lights, the en energies which the entities are using to manifest. And there's lots of things, depending on the situation, and combinations, combinations of these, these countermeasures um, uh, work, work, and different, and different combinations, combinations work in work different, different situations. situations. So, Mr. Bruce, do you, do you think that these, these methods are simply treating the symptoms in a way it, it was there, is there has there been a point for you personally where you've seen these psychic attacks stop completely is there like a disconnect that you've had to make with certain entities i have done that and i've experienced it myself yes uh, including major demonic attack on myself many years ago and i've done it with people as well but normally what happens here, it, it's a difficult thing to grasp because um, an entity will have like a psychic attachment, a cord, which it is attached to a person. Let's say you've, so got, you've got like, got like a, little a little spear and yeah. like a barbed spear and they hook it into a person and then they have something like the, you know, the silver cord of astral projection that connects your astral body to your physical body. It's something like that which connects the entity. Now, what happens is, of course, when you get in the shower, expose yourself to a, a strong electrical earth. I mean, using earthing bedding sheets, you can buy products for this now. 
Uh, it has amazing health benefits too. You can buy a bed sheet, which goes over the bottom half of your bed, uh, which has um, copper and silver threads woven into with the fabric. So when you, and this is connected to your power outlet and wired up to the ground outlet only, or you're connected to a metal water pipe or to a stake in the ground outside and various ways you can do it. So sleeping like that is the equivalent of sleeping in the shower. And it will also uh, help to drain that dark fluid out of a person if it's been a long-term type of attack. Hmm. Interesting. Do you find that people start to, because I'm kind of nocturnal and I like to be awake at night. Uh, do you find that people kind of drift into being, I mean, you in your book, you talk about how most attacks happen at night and you've rarely yeah. seen an attack that occurs while the sun is, is up. So... I and mean, why do you why do you think nighttime and the shadows have such an influence on these negative beings? Well, the reason for that is, I mean, I could tell you one thing. There is a completely different set of magical laws in operation uh, at night, from sundown to sunset. One completely different set of magical rules applies, and in the daytime, from sun up to sundown, another set of rules apply and it's generally the negative type entities are much more powerful at night now negative entities will operate during the daytime but usually inside houses you know uh, cellars and things like that out of the sunlight the sunlight seems to be detrimental to them uh, like it is for you know the vampires in the movies it seems to be very very detrimental to them so they avoid it and they'll often go, you know, go underground, go into a cave or in a, in cellar, a cellar or the darkest room in your house to avoid it. And, of course, they are more active at night. You know, Interesting. They've, they've done studies with, you know, they say like artists and people that are kind of dabbling with kind of a darker energy. They're usually night owls or they're, they're up later at night. Do you think they're kind of like playing with that in the, within that sphere? Well, they can do. If you, if, dab, dabbling is always a bad idea. But I, I don't want to give you the idea that the left-hand path is completely evil. It, it's like the left-hand path in magic is a, a valid path. Uh, so is the right-hand path. And, of course, everybody usually ends up on the middle path eventually, where you have an understanding of the entities and forces, which is different to how we've been programmed in the modern world. I mean, a lot of demons out there, the, the particularly the higher ones, uh, they're not what you think they are. In fact, they used to be called gods hundreds and hundreds of years ago in various, you know, groups, from, you know, um, that around the world. And angels, of course, we also know very, very little about them as well. As well. And these entities normally keep to themselves. Well, magically, you can, you know, um, have some contact with them, but you need to do the training and that and get an understanding of what you're doing before you get into that. But just dabbling, of any kind of dabbling, is always dangerous. Have you gotten any insight into what those spirits or entities want to do within this dimensional realm? Or why they have... What are they doing, doing in this space, basically? Well, there's a lot of different types. I mean, you can compare the greater reality, which is what we're talking about, the unseen uh, world, which uh, permeates yeah, and over, over, overshadows our world. Uh, it's like, say, talking about the ocean. You say, you look at the ocean and you say there's, you know, thousands of different creatures and entities in there. And some of them are largely harmless. I mean, like crabs, for example, are relatively harmless. If you tread on one, it might nip you. Um, you know, some of the bigger ones might, you know, make you bleed. If you run into a shark, of course, um, if it's the wrong type of shark, it might eat you or bite a leg off. But if it's other types of sharks, of course, a basking shark and that, they're harmless. You know, and, you know, it depends on the situation. Wow. I love that analogy. I'll be honest. I love that analogy of almost playing in that space. Um, you know, like people that are deep sea diving, you know, they got to be aware of certain elements. There's sharks, right? There's, there's anglerfish. There's, there's scarier animals. So it's almost that if you kind of play in that astral realm, as above, so below, there are going to be other kind of things that are going to be scarier to deal with. Is that, does that sound fair? Or? 
It does. Uh, but, but in the sense you're talking about there, that what you just said then, as above, so below, that is a part of a, a quote from the Emerald Tablet. Uh, and the Emerald Tablet, which is like the foundation of the hermetic uh, magical beliefs, uh, uh, the, the, it, it says, says as, as above, above so above. below, absolute truth, no ambiguity. Now, if you ha if you work like I do, and I frequently work with deceased spirits, and I visit the afterlife, and I've been studying the afterlife for like forty years, and when you start you you start to understand that as above, so below, and most people when they die, for example, don't know they've died, because their world is like unchanged. I mean, for example, if Somebody dropped an atomic bomb on your head right now and mine simultaneously. We're half a world away. We'd both notice this big flash of light and maybe a rumble for a second and say, wow, what was that? And, you know, and then we go on with our conversation. And we both cease to exist, of course, along with many other people, vaporized. But now we would continue talking for a very long time and maybe a couple of weeks would go by. And then at some point we'd say, wow, we've been talking for a long time and let's go get a cup of coffee. And we would stand up and I would appear from behind your monitor and you would appear from behind mine. Now we could find ourselves in my house or your house or a mixture of the two. And we go and make a coffee and maybe we get a cup of bagels. And we're sitting there drinking our coffee and eating our bagels. But the interesting thing here is, you could drink down half your coffee, but glance away, glance back, your coffee cup's full again. You take a big bite out of your bagel, glance away, and come, you know, look back again, it's, it's whole again. It, you know, it keeps repairing itself. It's an anomaly. Now, this is the afterlife. There's free coffee and bagels. How bad <laughs> can it be? Interesting, interesting. So, <laughs> the mystic Mr. joke there, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Bruce, do you think do you think that these negative entities beings they feed off of our emotions? Like do they feed off of our fear and the anxiety that we feel after an attack is occurring? All of the above. Uh, the human energy body and the human being uh, produces uh, lots of different types of energy. You have emotional energy, you have sexual energy, and you have raw vitality. And all of those things are, you know, they're the coin of the realm for different entities. The incubus succubus type entity, for example, feeds mainly on sexual energy. Um, and they can be a, a very big problem. I have some people I'm helping, helping with issues. That they've had um, a, a condition going on for a couple of years. And they're applying all of my countermeasures as, as they can, can and lots of other countermeasures. Some, some of these entities are really intractable, very, very difficult to shift. And the problem comes because, as we're talking about the electrical earthing and that, there are different stages of attachment in a psychic attack. Now, the stage one attack means that an entity is a couple of feet out from you. It's attached to your energy body at that point. Uh, now, when it moves further in, it will start to infiltrate your mind and your chakras. And when it gets its hooks in and integrates your into your chakras, it moves like inside of your physical body. And this shields you from electrical earthing and light and other things which are detrimental to negative entities. And that's why they do it, because then they can stay in there. And this is why uh, when you come under an attack, it's a really good idea to uh, take action very, very quickly, because give it a week or two and these things can become a lot more entrenched. I mean, something which is uh, a minor problem um, can become a major life-threatening, lifelong problem if you don't take the right action towards it. Do I'll you give you an example. Sorry. Um, a young lady, a uh, gorgeous young lady, um, a couple of years ago uh, came down and I'd gotten to know her and she was out working uh, temping in uh, a mental hospital, um, you know, about 20 miles from here. And she worked there a couple of days and in the morning she, f she felt this real 
nasty psychic attack. Her mind was getting polluted, weird thoughts and weird sensations in the body, weird fluttering and tinglings and like feelings like hands touching her. And she was a uh, very distressed. Now, she knew enough from talking to me. Uh, in a lunch break, she went down to the ocean. Now, she went to the ocean and walked into the surf up to her knees. And it stopped once she got about 10, 15 feet from the edge of the ocean. And she thought, wow, that's better. And um, she walked along a bit. But when she came out and walked back towards her car, it, uh, it you know, it nothing happened there, which it can do. It could just, like with the shower, it, it gets off of you and waits for you to come away from the water, and then it gets back on you. In this case, she felt fine. She drove back to a place of work. But about an hour after getting back to the same building, the same thing happened again. And she had to leave early, and she went, went to the beach again, tried the same thing again, but it didn't work. This time, um, she went to the water, and it released uh, from her, she felt fine, but went back to her car, and as soon as she stepped out of the water, 15 feet away, it nailed her again. Wow. And she did that a few times, and then knew she was in serious trouble. So she came uh, down to my place, un you know, unannounced. She turned up about 7 p.m. And uh, when a person has a problem like this, I will usually experiment in some way, uh, shape, or form, as well as helping the person, because I. Um, this is the, you have to take advantage of field situations to to learn more about what's happening. So I did a couple of experiments which were very very interesting uh, with her over about twenty minutes. You know she was hanging in there, and I knew I could get rid of it because it's recent. And then I took her outside my door. I've got this like forty feet of messy old garden hose um, coiled in just the right way so that the first hose.